you? Hey, what's up? Hey, man. It's great to finally have you on. We have um, myself, Leo, Justin, and Andrew here today. How's it going, gentlemen? Thank you for having me. Hey, Gabriel. Nice to see you. Hey, man. What's up, dude? I know, I know that voice. <laughs> yeah, always great to see you. Oh, yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Gabriel, we're really excited to have you here. Um, you know, we've just been doing a lot of spaces with various um, projects and, and members of Ava Labs, and, and I think you're the first engineer we've had on, so it's exciting to have you. Um, so the topics we want to cover today are mostly just your background, what you're doing um, with Avalanche and Ava Labs, and then maybe talk a little bit about DeFi and Avalanche Rush and all of that. How does that sound? Yeah, that's great. Um, if my connection might be a little iffy, so if uh, you don't hear me or something, of course, just ask me to repeat. Yeah, definitely. But uh, I mean, before we dive into just questions, how's your week been, man? Uh, my week is going great, man. We are, as you might imagine, insanely busy, as I'm sure you guys are as well. So uh, just super crunched. I'm getting ready to head out to Europe next week, and we've got Avalanche Rush going on and a bunch of Avalanche JS releases. So I think this is probably one of the busiest I've ever been in my life, but uh, everything is going great. Hey, yeah, I bet. And I really appreciate you carving out some time to talk to Pangolin and the community. This is awesome. Sure, of course. Happy to be here. Love Pangolin. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, it's, it's cool to hear that you're going to ETH Lisbon. I hear Avalanche has a pretty special event there um, that's going to be revealed soon. So yeah. excited to see what that's all about. Yeah, man. We've got a really cool, some really cool stuff happening. I am uh, very, very excited. I just got pulled into it at the last moment. I just found out I was going last week. So I'm <laughs> pretty jazzed and things are coming together at the last moment. But yeah, we've got some really cool stuff that's going to be there. Oh, wow. Awesome. Okay, well, we'll be peeping the Twitter for pictures and videos. Yes. Okay, so um, so Gabriel, tell us about your background and how you got to the Ava Labs team. I'm interested to hear. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'll kind of go back pretty far. So I did not, um, I don't have a degree, so I didn't really, I had a PC in my house growing up, but I was never, you know, introduced to it. Um, I didn't grow up spending a lot of time building websites or anything. None of my parents are, you know, engineers or anything like that. Um, one thing I did do a lot in high school is I spent a lot of time on IRC. So me and my friends used to just love to, you know, spend the entire weekend just cruise and free node and seeing what kind of cool chat rooms we could discover. And so just kind of place that in the background because IRC comes back into the picture in a little bit. So um, I actually went to school to study music. So my, in my 20s, I was actually a musician, not a software engineer. And um, when I found out that I was going to be a father at around 27 or so, 26, 27 years old, I found out I was going to be a dad. And um, I started, you know, I taking a hard look at my life and, you know, asking myself, what can you actually do that could provide for your family? And so at the time I was living on Kauai in Hawaii. That's where I met my son's mother. And I had a really good friend there named Jim Manico. And I had witnessed, um, I don't know if you guys remember, but the dot-com boom and bubble happened around 98, 99, 2000. And so um, I witnessed firsthand my friend who was a good computer scientist, a good engineer. He uh, had a really good job in the city in San Francisco and then the bubble popped and he was actually living on Kauai, all kidding aside, totally serious here. He was living on Kauai in a van, literally down by the river uh, because um, unlike today where there's just a ton of opportunity for people who have digitally native skills, Whenever the bubble popped, there actually was not work for this guy. And so I, I had this really good friend, an incredible engineer, who was living on, in his van on Kauai. And he was actually teaching like grade school, um, maybe like science or something. He was basically working at a, at a local school there on, on the islands um, because there was really no opportunity for him. And so I witnessed this guy go from living in his van to creating a white hat hacker like penetration testing company with a couple of his good buddies. 
And they ended up growing it and it got acquired. And so he ended up buying this beautiful piece of land on Kauai. He's still over there, just a big old house right by the water. A very, very, very nice house. And the whole time that I was witnessing this, he kept saying to me, like, man, Gabriel, I am positive that you could write code because um, I studied you know, classical music at school so I could read music and write music and play several instruments. And so he kept saying, like, man, I'm positive. If I can do this, I know you can do this. And so I was creating lightweight web pages uh, using like WordPress and GoDaddy, you know, clicking through setup wizards, nothing, you know, not, not touching code at all. But I had a, a, like a little bit of an understanding about how to create websites. And so basically to bring it back into the track, when I found out I was going to be a dad and I started asking myself, you know, like, what could you actually do if, to provide for your new family? Um, just I had the intuition, man, Manico used to say you could build websites professionally. And I already liked it. You know, it was something I enjoyed doing. And so I decided to go back to uh, here. I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And at the time when my son was born, we were in Santa Cruz. And there's a local, um, like a junior college there called Cabrillo. And so I went back and because it was the summer courses, basically the way it lined up is I was able to do three semesters of school over the course of two semesters. One of them was a summer semester, so it was super, super compressed time limit. And I didn't even get a, you know, I didn't get any associate's degree. I didn't get any um, certificates or anything because things started accelerating so quickly. Um, this is where IRC comes into the picture. So um, as I was writing code and as I was, you know, Googling, looking up answers and stuff, uh, my intuition was like, man, there must be an IRC channel for writing code. You know, little did I know there's like trillions of IRC channels for writing code. And, but I was like, man, there must be something on IRC. So I fired up Freenode IRC and I ended up finding my way to the HTML5 working group chat room. So this is actually the time when XHTML2 was still supposedly going to be the winner. This is the one that the W3C had officially blessed. And HTML5 was just like a skunk's work, skunk works project. And I still vividly remember my teacher at college being like, HTML5 is going nowhere, dude. You're wasting your time with that. XHTML2 is the one that they have blessed, and it's the one that's going to be huge. But to me, it was so obvious that, X, that HTML5 was the right idea because it was basically um, – all of the major browser vendors, so even Microsoft, Chrome was there, Firefox was there, Safari was there, Opera was there. So all of the five major players had, you know, read the signals and realized that developers wanted the web to be an application platform. And yes, XHTML2 was beautiful um, with regards to cleaning up the language and the semantics, but it wasn't an application platform. And so I just sort of intuitively knew, like, no, nah, man, especially with the explosion of mobile, HTML5 is where it's at. And so I ended up just investing a lot of my personal time at night and stuff hanging out in this chat room. And then one day, um, Ian Hickson, who I don't believe is at Google anymore, but he was the editor of the HTML5 group, uh, working group, real technical. Obviously, you guys cut me off with any questions here because this is a long-winded uh, answer. But um, Ian Hickson, the um, engineer, was uh, he was at Google, and he was the lead editor of the specification. And um, technically, again, this is some insider baseball stuff, but technically there is a working group called the WHAT, W-H-A-T, the WHAT Working Group, it stands for Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, and it was not formally part of the W3C. This was like a uh, just something these guys threw together on the side, but because they had all of this clout with being all of these major engineers from Google and Safari and Firefox, um, they were ultimately able to get leverage to get the W3C to kind of rubber stamp this HTML5 spec that they were working on. So one night, late at night, Ian is like, Hey guys, um, can anybody, he had some, basically like some ASCII artwork. This is still in the specification. Uh, if anybody, if you go to the HTML5 specification at the end, it lists the acknowledged contributors and my name is there. And if you dig through, I think there's like six different 
little pieces of uh, visual UI that I created with Adobe Illustrator of like showing sliders and different buttons and pop-ups. So basically this guy, Ian, had some ASCII art and he was like, can anybody create, you know, some mocks of this? And I was like, sure, I can. I'm studying Adobe Illustrator at school. Let me do something. So I threw it up. Uh, you know, I created it real quick and he put it right into the spec which was incredibly cool, right? So I had, a, I had made an official contribution to the spec, and he was like, hey, man, you're in the Bay Area, right? And I'm like, I am. And he's like, in two weeks, I forget how long it was. It was a couple weeks. In a couple weeks, we are having a technical plenary meeting, which is basically like where the engineers get together and hash out the details, and it's happening in San Jose. Every year, the W3C has a plenary meetup, and they're all over the world, and just by fortunate by the great fortune, it was in San Jose that year, which was, you know, very close to where I'm living in San Francisco. Uh, and he's like, um, do, you can come and Google will pay for you to be a member of the HTML5 working group because basically you had to be invited and then somebody had to sponsor you. I don't know how much it was. It was in the thousands. It wasn't an insane amount of money, but it was non-trivial, you know, especially to a college student at the time. And so he's like... Uh, we're having a plenary meeting. I'll sponsor you. We'll get Google to pay for you to be a member of the HTML5 working group, and then you should come up to this technical plenary meeting. So we did that, and that's how I ended up being a member of the HTML5 working group in college, and that plenary meeting was absolutely amazing. Tim Berners-Lee was there. Tim Berners-Lee, of course, is the gentleman who created HTML and CSS. Uh, he didn't create CSS. He created HTML and HTTP. So you know, the creator of the World Wide Web was actually one guy. He created it on a next step computer, which I think is pretty cool. So, you know, when Steve Jobs left Apple, he created Next and they created this insanely powerful box. It was like 10 grand a pop. Um, and it had this entire object oriented to development environment. And Tim Berners Lee was able to prototype the web using this machine. And I actually got to spend a half an hour of one on one time with Tim Berners Lee at the uh, technical plenary meeting, which was absolutely cool. I've got a picture of him holding my son, who was around a year and a half or two. My son's eating a big piece of pizza and Tim Berners-Lee is holding him. But okay, so to bring it forward a little bit, so um, I got my name in the HTML5 spec. So that ended up being something that I could use to pretty much get my foot in the door with any conversation. So while I was doing this, I was going to school uh, at Cabrillo here in Santa Cruz. And um, I got the opportunity to join Trulia, which was ultimately acquired by Zillow for $2.5 billion dollars. Uh, but it was based in San Francisco, and they wanted me to move there, and they were willing to, you know, pay for me to relocate from Santa Cruz to San Francisco. It's, you know, maybe like an hour, an hour and a half drive, and so that's the reason I ended up dropping out of school after about three semesters, and I relocated to San Francisco, and I was there for the IPO. We raised a hundred million dollars. Uh, we went public on the New York Stock Exchange. We did. Uh, we got to ring the actual bell. And I always use that experience as a comparison to what, you know, like an ICO and just how different it is going the traditional route and doing a, you know, a CEO roadshow and getting a bunch of lawyers and going public on the stock exchange compared to raising money with a token offering. It's an absolute, you know, thousand X multiplier to do an ICO. So basically I was at Trulia and I was there for the uh, IPO and had a, a lot of success there. And uh, this is in 2012. I took the money that I made from the IPO and I bought Bitcoin with it. So this is super early. I got my very first five Bitcoin for free in 2011. So I was already aware of it. So in 2012, I ended up investing most of the money I made from the IPO into Bitcoin. And so at the time, um, I had this vision for developer tooling for Bitcoin. So I was thinking about cloud services and an SDK and that kind of thing. The ability to launch, you know, launch an app on the cloud and all basically like Heroku. At the time I was thinking about, wouldn't it be cool if you had Heroku for Bitcoin? And so I called it Gitcoin, actually G-I-T-C-O-N. So this is before the, the Gitcoin, which is huge today. I had a little startup called Gitcoin that I was working on. And of course it didn't go far. Um, I was young. I didn't have the skills I had today. The Marco definitely was not mature and ready for that idea, but I was working on it. And so during this time, uh, between 2012, 2016, I was kind of doing contracting for big companies. So I built a, a website for Walmart. I built a website for Carl's Jr. I was just doing consulting for large firms. And, the, um, and Target also, we built the Target's Black Friday website. We got like 70 million hits in one day and the website didn't fall over. That was cool. 
And so um, around 2015, 2016, I was aware of the uh, Ethereum white and yellow paper and the token sale, and I was around for that. And I knew the Ethereum was going to be huge the first time I read about it, um, for sure. The first time I read the yellow paper, my mind was absolutely blown. And so then around, let's we'll kind of fast forward a little bit, around 2017, I was doing my own personal startup. I like 3D printers a lot. I'm into big, big into 3D printing. And so at the time, I, I was, if anybody knows about the Prusa, it's like a really, really great sub $1,000 open source hardware and software uh, software. Uh, desktop printer and it was just so damn good i just couldn't even believe it like the quality of this machine for 800 bucks just blew my mind and so i ordered a bunch of them i think I, well, not a bunch i ordered three and so each time i ordered one there was a huge uh weight to get it you know they were way backed up so whatever it said on the website you might as well tack three extra months on there because they just couldn't source them fast enough and so I remember at the time thinking, man, everything about this is, is open source, all of the hardware, all of the software. I could fork this project and I could just slap my brand on it and I could probably pick up some of the business, that, some of their overflow business just because they're so darn busy. And so I started working on something called Clone. It was a, it was a fork of the Prusa uh, desktop printer. And so while I was doing that, um, the ultimate prototype which I created was using Ethereum uh, blockchain, the web, and then the IoT, the Internet of Things, MQTT uh, protocol. And so basically the ultimate prototype which I had built was you were able to uh, do an Ethereum smart contract call and it would kick off a print on the 3D printer. That was my final prototype. But while I was learning about tr uh, Truffle, ultimately, using Udemy to learn smart contracts, my mind was just blown by Truffle. I don't know if anybody knows what Truffle is, but it's like the developer uh, toolkit for Ethereum. And so um, at the time, I just thought, man, this is like the best um, SDK that I have seen in the blockchain space. And being a software developer, I have had the realization multiple times that uh, the right tools will, you know, be a hundred x multiplier to your work, right? So it's like if you're going to build a house, do you want to manually create the hammer and stuff before you build the house? Of course not. You go to Home Depot and you get all of your tools and all of your primitives upon which you build your house with it. And so at the time, I just remember thinking, man, the real play here is to create uh, this developer tooling for Bitcoin Cash. So basically, another little bit of the backstory. Again, please cut me off, guys. I know this is long-winded, so feel free to jump in at any moment. I am going to how I ended up at Auto Labs, I promise. Um, so I, uh, whenever the Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash fork happened, I, of course, had Bitcoin on my Trezor hardware wallet. And so I got some free Bitcoin Cash. A few days after the fork, they gave us access to it. And so I just started playing around with it. And at the time, I just remember thinking, oh, I get it. And the very first time I used Bitcoin Cash, I totally got it. I was just like, oh, this is the quick and inexpensive Bitcoin that we all used to know and love. Because, of course, this was after the scaling wars and Bitcoin was slow and expensive at this time. And so immediately I was like, ah, oh, Bitcoin Cash, it's the Bitcoin I used to love. And so I actually um, aped into Bitcoin Cash really hard in the beginning, and that ended up working out really, really well because I don't know if anybody was around at the time, but in the very, very beginning of the Bitcoin Cash fork, it performed really well. And before there was a huge religious war about it, there was a lot of potential for Bitcoin Cash in the very, very beginning. And plus, I'm not part of the religion. I'm not part of the cult. I really do just love good engineering. And to me at the time, Bitcoin Cash just totally resonated with me. And so I... Um, had this idea, you should create something like Truffle, but for Bitcoin Cash. Okay, so that was on the back of my mind. Well, around, I think this is 2018 for New Year's, I went over to Kauai. Like I said, I met my son's mother there, so I always retreat there whenever I need to like have some personal um, mental space. And so I went there for New Year's, and I was just thinking, like, what can I do, man? I'm in such a good place right now. I can do whatever I want. Literally, I can fund any project I want. I can work on anything I want. What do I want to do? And so I hit up Pete. Pete Flint is the co-founder of Trulia. And so as I mentioned, Trulia was acquired for $2.5 billion by Zillow. It was actually $3.5 billion, but the, if I remember correctly, the, the SEC or some big... <laughs> 
big uh, American, you know, um, legal organization jumped in and said, no, I think we're going to shave a billion dollars off of that, which is crazy. But anyway, I hit Pete because now Pete's a venture capitalist in San Francisco because, of course, after uh, Truly got acquired, he did quite well on that. And so now he has a, a VC firm called NFX Guild, Network Effects Guild. NFX, if you guys look it up, it's, they're amazing. They've got such, such, they basically just trip out and super deep dive on the power of network effects. And so um, they have all these papers showing about, you know, like 90% of the value that's been created in Silicon Valley in the last 30 years comes from network effects driven companies and just tons and tons of great documentation on why network effects are such a big deal. So I hit Pete up and I was like, Hey man, um, I kind of gave him the high level. I'm just in a really good place right now. I'm like, I, I want to, I have a couple great ideas. I need somebody to brainstorm with. And he's like, sure, come by my office when you get back to San Francisco. So a couple weeks later, I was back in the Bay. I went by his office for a coffee, and we started talking. And so I told him, like, hey, man, um, I have this 3D printer startup. And, you know, so I started telling him about it. And he was like, man, I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, we have talked to, I think he said, literally 10 different 3D printer startups. And the only two we're talking to a second time, one of them 3D prints organs, like human body organs, and the other one 3D prints houses. And so um, if you do not have something extra special about your, your 3D printer, it's an incredibly tough field to break into. You know, hardware is hard, notoriously. Just think about how much money you're spending on each one of those machines, and then think how much you're selling it for. You know, how much profit are you making? Not a lot. How many of those machines are you going to need to sell to make a meaningful amount of profit? A lot. Um, do you think that's going to happen? Probably not because you don't have any edge against these other companies that can get this stuff for super bulk out of China and you can't because you're not buying it at that level and you don't have those connections. And I was like, all right, reason, you know, gotcha. And he's like, what else do you got? And I was like, okay, well, this other idea I've got is to do developer tooling for the blockchain. And I, so I started telling him about Truffle and Bitcoin Cash and all this stuff. And he's like, you know, man, from where we're sitting as VCs, venture capitalists, the biggest and the fastest money plays that anybody has ever seen, <laughs> you know, like literally anybody has ever seen is all in the blockchain space. And so um, if you have an edge in the blockchain, that's what I would focus on if I were you. And that was like the app, one of the best bits of wisdom that anybody has ever given me. And so that very night I sunset my clone uh, 3D printer startup. And that night I started working on what was called Bitbox. And so Bitbox was like Truffle. It was developer tooling for the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem, including a, an SDK written in TypeScript and JavaScript, similar to Avalanche JS, which I'm maintaining today. And then rest.bitcoin.com. Uh, so it was like a cloud service uh, with an, uh, an HTTP uh, API for hitting the Bitcoin Cash full node. And, and it absolutely blew up. It was genuinely the right idea at the right time. Within eight weeks, it had been downloaded from 105 or 110 different countries. It just went absolutely crazy all over the world. Because at the time, there was not a single other person who was creating developer tooling in that at that scale and that quality for Bitcoin Cash. There were a couple little one-off libraries, but nobody had come together and been like, I'm building a suite of developer tooling that's gonna get all everything you need, cloud services, SDK, and App Store, all of this stuff. And so um, it blew up. And then maybe like nine weeks or 10 weeks into the Bitbox journey, uh, it was late at night and I was just shutting down my work. It was like 11 and I was, I was in my desk and I get this DM on Twitter. And it's like, hey, man, are you the guy behind Bitbox? And I'm like, I am. And he's like, hey, Roger Veer. I don't know if you guys know who Roger Veer is, but they used to call him Bitcoin Jesus. He's like one of the very, very original guys in the Bitcoin scene that was uh, an investor. And so um, he's like, man, Roger really likes your work. Do you have a minute to talk to him? And I'm like, yeah, obviously. And so, you know, immediately, boom, I'm on a video chat call with Roger. And, he, you know, he's sitting at his office in Tokyo. And he's like, hey, man. I'm like, what's up? And he just went right for the kill. Didn't even waste a single sentence. He was like, you know, man, we really love what you're doing. We'd like to bring it under our brand. Do you want to move to Tokyo? 
<laughs> and I'm like, hell yeah, I want to move to Tokyo. So he's like, get your passport. And as soon as you get your passport, we'll fly you over here. So whatever it took me to get my passport, I had it expedited. So it was very quick. I was in Tokyo. And so ultimately, Bitcoin.com acquired Bitbox from me, um, which was cool, right? Because, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's kind of like a, you know, a dream that we all want to sell our startup to a big company. So that happened. They acquired my startup. And developer.bitcoin.com, if you check that out, that entire development uh, framework that they might be deprecating it now because I think they're deprecating uh, Bitcoin Cash as a part of their focus. But um, developer.bitcoin.com and rest.bitcoin.com and badger.bitcoin.com, um, which was a fork of MetaMask, all of this stuff was acquired by Bitcoin.com. I had created it and it became the foundation of Bitcoin.com's uh, developer ecosystem. And so I was at Bitcoin.com and we grew that team to uh, around eight or nine people. And um, at the end of 2019, so basically in, uh, it, it, at the end of 2018, I was in Italy in Milan at a, at a Bitcoin Cash Technical meetup. And Goon and Kevin from Ava Labs actually woke up at 3 a.m. or whatever it was for them in Ithaca, New York, and they gave us a presentation on Avalanche. And so I found out about Avalanche in about 2018, and I just started having this crisis of confidence uh, about Bitcoin Cash. Because, you know, I'm a developer evangelist, and I have to believe in the technology that I'm on stage selling. And that's the reason I do this job, because I do believe in these tech stacks. But I just started to realize how the, the power of DeFi and tokenomics and smart contracts and prediction markets and DAOs and, you know, just how powerful this DEX is and... And I realized that Bitcoin Cash could not compete. And so I started having a really big crisis of confidence. And so right before COVID, at the very, very end of 2019, I stepped away from my job at Bitcoin.com. I was like, all right, guys, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm out. I can't really um, focus on this anymore. Plus, I had gone through some personal stuff. Um, my father passed away, and so did a couple other family members. And so there was just a combination of a lot of stuff was hitting me all at once. And I was like, you know, I just need some personal time. I'm going to take some downtime. And so I left Bitcoin.com. Well, when I left, Goon and Kevin reached out to Chris, Chris Troutner, amazing dude, Trout, the guy who took over for me at my job there. And they're like, hey, man, we love developer to Bitcoin.com. Um, do you think you want to join all the labs and do something similar to that developer tooling for Avalanche? And he was like, you know, I don't want to leave the Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash ecosystem. However, the guy you need to talk to is Gabriel. He's the guy who created all of this stuff anyway. And so Goon and Kevin reached out to me and they're like, hey, man, are you interested in doing developer uh, evangelism for Ava Labs? And uh, we had a meeting and we just hit it off. Like the very first call was a really, really great convo. Um, and so that's ultimately how I became the developer evangelist at Ava Labs. That was an incredible story. I enjoyed <laughs> every moment of that. <laughs> Thanks for sitting through that. I know that was, that was a long-winded one. I appreciate it. No, that is, that is incredible how, how you have so much background in history and so many successes, and, and you're still pushing so hard to build out this space. Uh, I love to hear that. Thank you, man. And I just want to also comment on, like I feel like everyone I meet at, Ava Labs has some sort of incredible backstory like this. Like that's the level, that's the quality of people that get hired there and are building the Avalanche network. Really amazing. Yeah, there's no question about it. Ava Labs is the best team I've ever worked on. And you know, your team is your single greatest asset, right? There's an infinite amount of money out there. There's an infinite amount of ideas out there. But getting together people who are, you know, smart and hardworking and creative and trustworthy and all of these things is really, really the hardest challenge, as I'm sure you guys have discovered. Like, getting good people is not easy and keeping good people is not easy, especially in this space where there's just so much happening and there's so many other people who would love to just swoop in and take them away from you and offer them some crazy incentive. And so um, there's no question about it. Ava Labs is the best team that I have ever worked on with. Starting at the very top with Goon and Kevin and John and Ted, all the way down the entire org chart, 100% um, Ava Labs is just made up of some A quadruple plus players. It's truly an honor to be on that team. Definitely, definitely. Shout out to Tyler, too, who, who's oh, yeah. working with you guys. He's yeah. on the call. Oh, Tyler's here. What's up, dude? 
Oh, I see him as a listener. Yeah, Tyler is an absolute champion. He's one of my favorite engineers in the whole space and has been for many years. That dude is a is an A player as well. I agree. Cool. So we got a really good intro on how you got to where you are. A couple other topics I'd like to cover while we have time are uh, so what you're working on. Uh, maybe get your thoughts on Pangolin, and then just bring it up high level to Avalanche. So, so let's talk about what you're working on. Like, what are you focused on these days building? Sure. So I am developer evangelist, and so I primarily focus on uh, we have developer services and we have developer tooling. My team, basically we have a squad. The Ava Labs org chart is very flat on the engineering side, so we don't technically have teams. We have what are called squads. It's just a little bit flatter of an org chart, but I am the head of the squad I'm on. It's developer relations, and it breaks into developer tooling and developer um, services. And so um, the developer services side of it is um, maintaining a lot of our social channels. So Discord and Telegram and uh, Twitter and Reddit, and I'm sure there are others. But so just having an overview of that, we do daily diary style. Um, uh, each day we'll do like a diary of certain channels uh, on Discord, for example. And then we have process for, you know, surfacing questions to the correct people on our team and that kind of thing. So part of it is uh, maintaining our social channels. And there's a team of people who help me, obviously. And then the other part is developer tooling. So we have Avalanche JS, which is similar to Bitbox. It's our TypeScript uh, library, TypeScript and JavaScript for web, um, full stack. So you can do you know server and client. It's built with Node JS and TypeScript. And then we also have what's called a Vush, which is our sort of our ganache, except where ganache is like a simulator. Um, a Vush is a straight up network of um, full blown Avalanche Go instances. And so you can use Lua scripts to basically automate and bring up a development environment. So, for example, we have a little script that lets you bring up a five-node staking network. And you can pass in a bunch of different flags, just like you would if you were firing up Avalanche Go. And so I maintain, um, I, I help maintain, or I lead the squad that maintains uh, Avalanche JS and Avash, and then also all of the different social channels. And then I also just do uh, developer advocacy. So kind of what I'm doing here today or, you know, flying out to Lisbon next week to attend a conference and, you know, interface with engineers and maybe give a presentation. And I was in Wyoming two weeks ago at the Wyo Hackathon there. So attending, you know, meetups and hackathons and conferences and uh, trying to get people stoked to join our platform. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, also I do partner integration. So, you know, as you might imagine, we have just a billion different companies and teams that are integrating Avalanche into their stack. And so a big part of what I do every day is just on Telegram or Slack, uh, interface with engineers and sort of like hand hold or hold their hand, you know, while they on ramp into our ecosystem and try and answer their questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll get the answer for them. Wow, that is a lot of things going on. Uh, but <laughs> I, I do want to comment on you know just how robust, professional, and high quality um, the, all the developer tooling is. And, and maybe I'd like to get some color commentary from Justin, who does have an engineering background. Uh, Justin, what do you think of um, all the work that Gabriel and his team are doing? Yeah, it, it's amazing. I mean, everyone, like we see it, I think, probably at a... a, a a, a much deeper level than perhaps some other people that, that aren't involved in the day to day. So, you know, you, you, what you see is, you, you know, uh, you, you've got all these tools like Avash, you've got all these kind of like subsidiary tools that help the developers. So, um, you know, one of the key things that Gabriel mentioned earlier is how good are the developer tools. So if you want to build something, you don't want to be building it without good tooling to help you. And I think Ava Labs have been really, uh, I guess, smart about that and, and, and quite considerate to the developer experience. I mean, like Avash, you can spin up a quick node with like five different uh, validators. You can then like, so all of these things, instead of then starting from scratch as a developer, like you would at like Cardano or some of these other kind of uh, chains, you have a much more mature tool set, which then allows you to build a lot more frequently, deliver quicker, Obviously, that helps with your community. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really great that those tool sets. And, I mean, now you're starting to see even on top of that, you, you know, you're starting to see, like, some of the VM tooling coming out. And, yeah, I think it's all just very exciting. 
Awesome. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Justin. Appreciate your thoughts on that. And um, so the next project I want to ask you about, Gabriel, is is your Subnet Show podcast. I'd like to hear about how that got started. Really great content on there. You and Connor providing some really quality um, insight and guests. Can you tell us about how Subnet Show started? Sure, and thank you. I appreciate that. So yeah, for years I've wanted to do a podcast. Um, a couple times I've tried to pull something together and it's just not happened. Connor said the same thing. He tried to do a podcast with a friend a couple years ago, and I think they only did three episodes. And so really it just came down to um, recognizing that Avalanche is something special. You know, like, um, as I mentioned, I got my first Bitcoin in 2011, so I've just seen so many different generations and waves of teams and technology. And, you know, Goon has been uh, on my radar for many years. I'll admit I didn't know Kevin or Ted or John. I didn't know any of those guys, but I'm sure as heck knew Goon. And he has been one of my technical heroes for years. And so um, when I saw Avalanche Consensus, when I first read the first white paper, I really did appreciate, like, this is, in fact, a paradigm shift. Because, see, one of the things I believe and this is, this is backed by you know, data. If you go and geek out with Ray Kurzweil, I'm a big believer in the singular, this idea of the singularity. And basically just the pace of change is accelerating. And we're fortunate enough to be living at a time where the pace of change is accelerating so radically uh, that it could very well end up being disruptive to you know, our society or even the human condition, depending on how far and how fast these things end up going. Because you can imagine, like, what is the world going to look like in 50 years? You know, how fast is the pace of change going to be in 50 years? Are we even going to be able to keep up with it if we're not augmented in some way? That's kind of this idea of the singularity. And so um, basically, I just had an appreciation that Avalanche was a paradigm shift. And I knew this was a unique opportunity for myself to create a podcast because of my role at Ava Labs, I just have uh, so many great connections, like with um, Harry Seldon here, right? <laughs> um, just so many people who we know who we can get a, a chat with, which was unique at any time in my career. I was just especially plugged in here. So I just decided, you know, like I believe that Avalanche is going to be huge. I do believe there's going to be thousands and thousands of subnets. We're building the internet of finance, and, you know, in the same way that the internet or the, the analogy I use is the work that we're doing today, yourself included, the work that all of us that are building this ecosystem are doing today is going to have effects uh, for years and years similar to the real internet. So you could argue that the guys and gals who created the TCP IP stack in the 70s um, are having a greater impact with their work today, literally today, than they ever did because the web just every or the web and the internet every single day increases its power and you know its uh, its impact on our lives. And so I really do believe that the work we are doing building the um, internet of finance is going to have uh, repercussions that are going to be lasting for decades and dec decades and potentially even generations. And so just in that context I just realized that um, this is a unique opportunity to uh, have conversations with a lot of people now in these early, early days whose work is going to end up being incredibly powerful. And, you know, Connor is like the great example, right? Connor's a young man. He's in his 20s. I don't know how old he is, 27, I think, but whatever it is, he's a young man, right? Um, I'm sure that his best, best days are still ahead of him with regards to work. He's just such a sharp dude, and everything is getting sharper every day. And so that was really it. I mean, that was kind of the heart of it, just appreciating that Avalanche is going to be huge and I'm uniquely positioned to you know, be able to have a conversation with nearly anybody who's building on the ecosystem. And then myself and Connor were working together building out the, uh, the NFT platform, which you know recently launched Godzilla and MLB and Bundesliga. We were the two engineers building that. And so we just got to really connect, and I really like Connor. Um, I think of him as a good friend. He's an incredibly easy dude to get along with. It's, a, it's very easy for us to have a conversation. It's very natural. Our conversations flow because there's just so freaking much to talk about. So that's it. Just appreciating that Avalanche was a paradigm shift, appreciating that I was uniquely positioned to get good um, content, and then also meeting Connor, or, you know, connecting with Connor at that exact moment, and him also saying he wanted to do a podcast. We just figured, hey, let's give it a try. 
That's awesome. Yeah, if anybody listening hasn't checked out the Subnet show yet, go give them a follow on Twitter. Check them out on YouTube and a bunch of other platforms. They've had great projects on Pangolin, Sherpa Cash, Trader Joe, a bunch of other ones too. It's a yeah, great show. Thank you. You can check out subnet.show. That's the, the URL, subnet.show. Awesome. Thanks for talking us through that. Um, so another topic I wanted to get your thoughts on is just Pangolin itself, Gabriel. Um, can you tell us your thoughts on Pangolin's journey and, and where it is today? Yeah, so I know there's a lot of competition for Pangolin. I know we have a ton of DEXs out there, but Pangolin is still my go-to for whatever it's worth. If that matters to anybody, Pangolin is still my go-to. So I think Pangolin is really, really special in a, in a few different ways. So if you go back and you look at the graph, which shows you know the number of transactions happening on the C chain, and you and you look at the time part of the uh, chart, you can notice that right when Connor initially shipped Pangolin, within a week, give or take, in either direction, um, the number of transactions on our network just started exploding. And so, to me, Pangolin is very important because it's a milestone that really showed people that what we were selling wasn't just hype, that we did in fact have an instance of the EVM, but instead of Nakamoto consensus, we had snowman consensus. And so you get these you know, high throughput and fast finality and inexpensive fees, but it's 100% backwards compatible with you know, existing EVM tooling. So if you have something like Uniswap, you can straight up fork it drop it into the Avalanche network, and with relatively minor integration, it will work. And so that's what happened with Pangolin. Pangolin was a fork of Uniswap. Uh, Connor dropped it into our network. It worked, and it absolutely blew up. And so um, I think it's really interesting because it was sort of like the first DEX and DAO that went live on Avalanche that were huge. And I told Connor this at the time. I'm a big believer that social equity is worth more than money. Now, we all love money. Everybody wants more money. That's obvious. It's not even worth saying. But in the big picture, in like the, hey, we're all going to leave this world sometime kind of picture, social equity is actually worth a lot more than money because social equity is what people think about you. Social, equ or, um, social equity is like, do people take me at my word? Will people, uh, do people want to work with me? Um, what will people say about if and when I leave this world, right? That to me is what social equity is. And that's worth more than money. You cannot buy social equity with an infinite amount of money. You can't go out there and pay people to think good things about you. And so whenever the project launched, I remember telling Connor, like, dude, you are now wealthy <laughs> with regards to social equity. You have just accomplished a huge milestone that will forever be set there, like, you know, it's like in stone forever. Connor created the first, he forked it to, you know, to give credit where it's due, but Connor created the very first DEX, and I'm sure he had help, you know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying this right now, but just sort of using him as a symbol here. Um, Connor created the very first DEX, and it went live, and um, it absolutely helped our network explode. And so I think Penguin is just very important because it was the first. Um, it's still one of the best, in my opinion. Uh, it has go real governance, so it's a straight-up DAO. And um, I just think that you guys have done an absolutely great job of bringing together a really high-quality team and just creating a really high-quality project. And like I said, it's still my go-to. I recently just used it to consolidate all kinds of different coins back and forth. And every one of my friends, which I on-ramp into the ecosystem, all of my family, all my old friends from high school, I turn them all on to Pangolin first and foremost. That's the very first app I show them when, they, when I'm introducing them to, you know, how does Avalanche work? What can I do with Avalanche? I take them immediately to Pangolin. And so I think you guys have just killed it with regards to being a great DEX and a great DAO. And it seems to me like you have a, a really high quality team. As I mentioned earlier, your team is your single greatest asset. You know, um, having talked to Trollop and um, now talked to you, I just get a sense of where you guys are coming from and that you guys really do believe in this. And so far, you guys have stayed uh, Avalanche only, although for what it's worth, you will never get a, I won't hate on you guys if you go multi-chain. I understand the nature of the world, but for what it's worth, you guys are an Avalanche native project and you guys have stayed true to the game. So um, I just think you guys were the first and in my opinion, you're still one of the best. Hey, that, that means a lot to us to hear that, Gabriel. 
uh, I, I do think that, like you said, Connor did a great job, and then handing it over to the community for an independent team. Um, it's been a really, really good experience, and, and for the growth of the Avalanche, it's been crucial. And so, um, before we run out of time, I wanted to let people get off their questions. I see Mr. Hello from, I think, Teddy Cash is here. But my final question for you, Gabriel, is just, what, what's your vision for growth on Avalanche? Like, where, where do we have to get to before you're satisfied with how much it's grown? Yeah, so I, I have been saying for years, and I do believe this, that even before the concept, the Internet of Finance was a thing that I knew about. So long before I even knew about Avalanche, I was saying the blockchain has the potential to be as meaningful as the web and beyond. And so in the same way, the web really just took the totality of all human information and knowledge and made it ubiquitous. Um, the blockchain has the potential to do that with money and finance. And, you know, money is critical to the human condition. And sometimes when I say that, that maybe it seems a bit shallow because it's like, really, dude, money is critical to the human condition. What I mean by that is um, as long as there are sentient, hardworking creatures out there, <laughs> humans or not, I mean, AI, aliens, it doesn't matter. As long as there are sentient beings and they, and they work hard, there is going to be a subset of those beings which really, really work hard and have a creative vision and ultimately push the entire group forward. And so, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. There's been some really amazing humans who've come along. Sir Isaac Newton comes to mind, and they just, Satoshi comes to mind, right? And they just do such outrageous work that it pushes the entire, all of humanity forward. And so um, for years, I've been saying, you know, the blockchain has the potential to be as meaningful as the web and beyond. And in my opinion, you know, Bitcoin and even Ethereum just had not reached its full potential. And that's simply because Nakamoto consensus is slow and expensive. And so when Avalanche consensus was created, it was clear to me that this is a coming of age moment for the web. So in the same way that the web came around in 94. By 98, 99, uh, a lot of hype was there and entrepreneurs and hackers and computer scientists and academics and industry professionals all appreciated that, hey, man, the web is going to change everything. Um, but people started playing around with it in 98, 99, and they realized, you know, this tech, so all this money rushes in, right, the dot-com bubble, and the people start playing around with the technology, and they're like, you know, I just don't think this is mature enough yet. Um, and so a lot of money rushed out of the web and the bubble burst. But the people who uh, saw the vision continued to work on it. And in around 2004, 2005, um, Ajax, which is asynchronous JavaScript and XML, emerged. And there was a handful of technologies around that, like CSS and modern ECMAScript, which is like JavaScript. Um, and mobile, so all of these things started, well, mobile wasn't 2005, I should say, that was 2009, but around 2004, 2005, we had this Ajax thing, Web 2.0, and from Web 2.0, we get, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Flickr and all of these companies that end up being, you know, just huge, huge, huge players in our everyday lives emerged from this time, and so when the avalanche consensus emerged, in 2018 or so, I immediately saw it as, okay, this is the coming of age moment that we've all been waiting on. Now all of a sudden it's practical to do dApps and have the user experience be similar to a, an actual traditional app. Because even with Ethereum, 15 seconds for your next state change, 15 seconds for each block is still really slow. And so, you know, you can think about um, different, uh, different firms which... Uh, locate their co their, their co-location facilities at different places around the world so that they can shave off like microseconds from this web request um, to do like front running basically to do like uh, trading of stocks and that kind of stuff that it's hard to compete with them if you're creating a DEX on Ethereum because every 15 seconds you're going to get that state change and that's just not fast enough but with Avalanche Consensus you know we get 200 milliseconds for a immutable irreversible block time right so about the, the amount of time it takes to blink your eyes literally the blink of an eye 
is how fast it gets to get your state change on avalanche. And so I immediately recognize like this right here is the coming of age moment we've all been waiting for. It's practical now to actually buy your coffee with crypto because as soon as you hit scan, boom, it's done and settled. And it's practical to run these DEXs. It's practical to do prediction markets. All of these technologies, which seemed really cool, that they just weren't quite practical became practical with Avalanche. So, you know, I realized that Avalanche was a paradigm shift and that it was going to change everything. Um, how far do we need to go? Well, I believe that we're building the Internet of Finance and that it's going to be as transformative as the Internet. And, you know, the Internet touches everybody's lives, um, whether they even know it or not. You know, we can be talking about Stone Age tribes out there that still have had barely any contact with man, and the Internet has an impact on their life through second and third order effects of people being able to go out and study them and record them and all of these different things and much, much easier. And so, you know, to me, I think we're really, really early um, simply because of how big I think ultimately Avalanche is going to grow to be. Um, but the pace of change is accelerating. And in the next 10 years, we will experience more technological innovation than we did in the previous 100 years. So if you can wrap your mind around that one, that, that'll blow your mind out of your head. In the next 10 years, we will experience more technological innovation than we have in the previous 100 years. And so, you know, how far do we have to go? I, I just think until the blockchain is truly ubiquitous and mainstream. And um, it's incredibly disruptive because of how powerful money is. Everybody knows the golden rule, right? He who has the gold makes the rules. And we're creating an entirely new financial system. So it's very, very disruptive. And regulation is certainly coming because the government needs to try and wrap their mind around this right now. But it's just the pace of change is accelerating so rapidly. I'm not entirely even sure what they can do because the genie is just out of the bottle right now. And there's no way to put it back in. It's a one-way door when we step through it. And so, yeah, I just think um, until the blockchain is as ubiquitous as the web or as the internet, uh, we're not there yet. And I think that's where we're headed. Wow, that that was an amazing explanation, Gabriel. Uh, I'm already <laughs> incredibly bullish on on crypto, DeFi, blockchains, and avalanche. I work in it every day. But <laughs> listening to you speak and you describe these things very well, by the way, it makes, me, it makes me even more bullish. <laughs> but um, hey, before we run out of time here, just want to say I really appreciate you coming on. I, I want to take a question from the audience. It looks like Mr. Hello has something to ask, so I'm going to add him. Hey, Mr. Hello, how are you? Great. Uh, it's really great to, 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 to have Gabriel on. I'm really enjoying it. Gabriel, um, quick question. Uh, do you know of any work that's happening in terms of identity and specifically things like digital, you know, decentralized identifiers? Because I, I think we all experience that it's, it's pretty terrifying to send a large amount to, you know, a hexadecimal address. You just copy and paste it. Yeah, so there is, uh, what's it called? Cash address, I think. Um, cash adder, ah, I forget what it's called. It's been a while since I was in that ecosystem. In the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem, basically you can create like usernames effectively, which map to your address. Um, so I know there there's work out there. So there's multiple, kind of like there's multiple ways to approach the problem. I know already that there's a team called Ceramic, which has done some identity work on Avalanche. And I know that there's a couple other ones that are working in the, uh, in the background, but I don't think they're yet public. But yeah, um, gosh, I wish I could remember what it was called. There's a format in uh, Bitcoin Cash, which allows you basically create like a username, but it's, uh, it, it maps to your address and you can reuse it and everything like that. Um, ultimately, I do think that will emerge because ultimately what has to happen is user experience, right? User experience is the win. It's the reason that it's one of the reasons that Apple became one of the most valuable companies in the world. And it's one of the reasons that Steve Jobs gets the love that he does. Love him or hate him, you do have to appreciate that the Macintosh, of course, the Macintosh was copied from the uh, Xerox uh, Park, the Alto, I think was what the name of the computer was. So, you know, they don't get total credit for it. But uh, the, the, the geniuses that worked in Xerox Park basically in the late 70s that ultimately found their way to Apple after getting acquired um, really did appreciate that going from the command line to the GUI was a huge leap forward. And it's, it's, it's one of the, the things that helped computing go mainstream. And then going from the GUI to the touch interface 
was the next big leap forward, right? It's the reason that you can see literal two or three year olds who are able to swipe back and forth and tap on a screen because it's just so intuitive to the way that we, you know, what we do. We literally do swipe and tap in the real world. And so we need that same breakthrough in the crypto industry. And it's one of the biggest opportunities out there. Literally, there's a huge opportunity for the Apple, pardon the horrible cliche, but the Apple of the crypto space to emerge. Anybody who can come in and make this um, so usable that people who are not digitally native, people who don't understand any of this are able to use it, are, are, are able to use it, are the ones who are going to win this game. And so, as I mentioned, there's already a team called Ceramic, which has launched some ID stuff on our, our platform. And there's a couple other ones that I don't think are public yet that I can announce. But yeah, there's no question about it. One of the next big waves of innovation that I expect to see because we have to see it because, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and we absolutely need these tools in order to on-ramp the mom and pops of the world, the grandma and grandpas of the world is getting rid of, rid of these, you know, ugly BEC32 encoded addresses and replacing them with something which is much more like a username. And there is something like this that already exists. I don't think it's cash adder, but I'm forgetting what it's called. It's something in the big There's cash ecosystem. There's also Brat RD on Ethereum, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't think it exists on Avalanche yet. Um, but yeah, I know, I know on Ethereum, Brat RD is pretty popular. Right, and that could work on Ethereum, on Avalanche, which is one of the cool things. One of the big wins about Avalanche is that we're backwards compatible with Ethereum dev tooling. So if you ever see something really cool on Ethereum, it will work better, faster, and quicker on Avalanche. And so, yeah, I think the opportunity is ripe for somebody to sweep in and do like a UI win for um, crypto. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, it's something I feel like, again, we all use Avalanche to, for, for certain kinds of applications, but I feel it would be much more integrated in our workflow if we had real identity. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know anyone that's, uh, you know, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to get involved in that if anyone, if you, if you want to send me any contact with that, I'd love to get involved in that. Sure, this is Mr. Hello, right? That's correct, sir. Yeah, okay, I'll follow up with you offline. Awesome. Thanks for coming on and, and asking. That was a good topic, Mr. Hello. And for those who don't know, Mr. Hello is a co-founder of the Teddy Cash Project. Really cool project. Yeah. Um, cool. So we are just want to be conscious of everyone's time and your time, Gabriel. Let's kind of give some closing thoughts and, and wrap up here. So we had a really great chat with Gabriel. Just learned a ton about his background and his thoughts on the industry and this space and avalanche. Gabriel, do you want to give us some final thoughts before we say goodbye to our listeners? Yeah, um, I think the best thought I have is simply that there's never been a better time in all of human history to have an amazing idea and to change the world. You know, it's never been easier to find like-minded people. It's never been easier to raise capital. It's never been easier to take an idea and uh, have it go viral around the entire world and, you know, in the course of an hour or something. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have a degree in computer science. Uh, everything is available online. Everything, nearly everything is available for free as open source software and even open source hardware these days. Uh, we're just, we are living during the Renaissance and yeah, it's easy to look out at the world and realize how messed up it is in so many different ways. But you can flip it and say it's also just so amazing in so many ways. There's really no other time in human history that I personally would rather have been born. And so I would just like to encourage everybody out there, like, don't dwell upon the past. Don't dwell upon the mistakes you made in the past. Don't dwell upon, don't have, you know, imposter syndrome and don't feel like you're good enough to be part of the tribe. Uh, just own it. And start working your butt off today, and I assure you, you can be outrageously successful in, you know, as fast as you want it. And so I think I would just simply close with, uh, there's never been a better time in all of human history to have an amazing idea and to change the world with that idea. That was really beautiful. Well put. Thank you so much for that, Gabriel. And um, Justin, Andrew, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up today? All good, my thought. Okay, awesome. Gabriel, it's been a pleasure. Always enjoy talking to you, and best of luck with your journey uh, at Eva Labs, and have a great time at ETH Lisbon. Uh, this yeah. is Leo from Pangolin. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming in and listening, and have a great day. Thanks, you guys. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Cheers.